Epstein Barr is a gamma herpes virus. There's three classes: alpha, beta, gamma. The gamma viruses are primarily you won't hear Carposi too much. It, it primarily creates a sarcoma, but Epstein Barr is a gamma herpes virus. And what that means is that it will create a latency within the host, meaning as it infects the body, it's going to stay there. Epstein-Barr, this is interesting, because Epstein-Barr primarily infects immune cells. In the Western population, it's primarily B lymphocytes. In the Asian population, interesting, it's T lymphocytes due to some genetic differences, I believe. So Epstein-Barr, and there's a few little factoids that I think that are really relevant to this. And 95% of the world population will test positive for exposure to EBV. In other words, everyone gets this virus. No one is spared. And that's pretty safe. So you're going to see 95% of your patients test seropositive for IgG viral capsid antigen. We'll discuss that later. So, so with that broad overview of individuals that are exposed to this virus, then how is it that we're even having this discussion? And what is going on with this virus that would even lead to us having a podcast about chronic Epstein-Barr, right? Welcome to the Capital Integrative Health Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Andrew Wong. Today, we're going to cover the topic of chronic Epstein-Barr virus, or EBV, with Dr. Christopher Bump. Dr. Bump is a functional medicine practitioner with over 35 years of experience in clinical nutrition. His practice philosophy includes integrating science-based alternative and integrative therapeutics applied with the system's biology approach. So what happens when viruses enter the body and how can our bodies more effectively respond to them? Today, we'll uncover the mysteries surrounding chronic EBV infections, discuss the potential long-term effects on our health, and explore effective strategies for diagnosis and treatment of chronic EBV using functional and integrative medicine. Please join us today for this enlightening conversation that will provide valuable insights for those affected by chronic EBV and give you steps to strengthen your own immune system. Welcome to the Capital Integrative Health Podcast, Dr. Bum. Thanks so much for coming on today. Well, Andrew, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here and I'm excited to have a conversation with you. Yeah. Yeah, so we're really excited to get into this conversation, Chris, about chronic Epstein-Barr virus. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we know that there's been a lot of um, talk about how to treat this virus. You know, there's also different opinions about whether or not chronic EBV is even a thing. So I think we'll want to get into that from the sure. conventional perspective as well. Um, before we get into that, I um, always like to ask our guests, and I think our listeners really like to hear this too, a little about your story. And, and what drew you to become a functional medicine practitioner? Uh, sure. Um, so you might be able to tell that my hair is a little silvered. And so consequently, um, I'm a little on the other side of age, which means that I've been practicing a long time, 40 some odd years now, actually. And I, it, it's interesting journey, and I, I won't go through too much of it, but just know that I went through chiropractic education to use it as a port of entry in the late 70s to create this holistic model, which evolved into functional medicine. Back then in the 70s and 80s, we called it holistic medicine. So I went through chiropractic because I felt that that was a, it was a, um, an easier port of entry for me than the indoctrination of traditional medicine. So, um, and so I've grown up with the concept of functional medicine um, and still I'm learning and growing um, as we speak. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. well, well, chiropractic medicine is is inherently holistic and there's, there's a lot of interconnections that, that happen yeah. there, is that right? Mm -hmm. Agreed. It, it, the philosophical foundation of chiropractic is simple that, you know, nerves, the neurologic supplied to 
the systems, um, if it's interrupted, may um, interrupt function. I, I took a, a slightly different philosophical approach um, and never really subscribed to the traditional chiropractic, but more like always looking at human health through a structure function relationship. And, uh, and I suspect we'll have an opportunity to discuss what I mean by that. Um, because right down to the cellular level, we can address the structure of the cell and hence function of the cell. And yes, that's... love to get into that today. So let's kind of take a deep rabbit hole dive in. Sure. Um, Sure. Uh, we we got some rabbits during the pandemic, so this is kind of <laughs> one of the things I love yeah, to say. Now sure. we started our podcast during the pandemic, so kind of Good. some rabbit hole questions. Yeah. Um, let's talk about what Epstein Bar is EBV. You know, a lot of people may know that you know, or, or not, they may not know that you know Epstein Bar can kind of stick around after what's called acute infectious mononucleosis, which is caused by EBV. But let's talk about sort of at first, what is Epstein-Barr virus? What is chronic Epstein-Barr virus? And then how does it differ from say acute EBV infection? Sure, I, that's a really good springboard um, for our discussion, Andrew. So Epstein-Barr is a gamma herpes virus. There's three classes, alpha, beta, gamma. The gamma viruses are primarily, you won't hear Carposi too much. It, it primarily creates a sarcoma. But Epstein-Barr is a gamma herpes virus. And what that means is that it will create a latency within the host, meaning as it infects the body, it's going to stay there. Epstein-Barr, this is interesting, because Epstein-Barr primarily infects immune cells. In the Western population, it's primarily B lymphocytes. In the Asian population, interesting, it's T lymphocytes, due to some genetic differences, I believe. So Epstein-Barr, and there's a few little factoids that I think that are really relevant to this. And 95% of the world population will test positive for exposure to EBV. In other words, everyone gets this virus. No one is spared. And that's pretty safe. So you're going to see 95% of your patients test seropositive for IgG viral capsid antigen. We'll discuss that later. So, so with that broad overview of individuals that are exposed to this virus, then how is it that we're even having this discussion? And what is going on with this virus that would even lead to us having a podcast about chronic Epstein-Barr, right? So <clears throat> the acute phase of, of EBV infection is, as you know, typically classified as mononucleosis. In that time period, immunity is built up and the host immunity will shift from acute reaction, and that's where you would measure IgM, and that will last typically two weeks. After that, there are two different markers that continue to remain elevated. One is called viral capsid, and the other is called nuclear antigen. Um, I might be getting a little ahead of myself here with this, Andrew, but know that anyone who has been exposed to EBV will show an elevated VCA or viral capsid antigen. Typically, but not always, they will also show an elevation of a nuclear antigen. I'll explain that later. So in most individuals, the virus then creates what is called a latent phase. It goes into the cell, establishes residence. And the way I describe it, Andrew, it, it sets up shop. It sets up a platform for it to, in a sense, regulate the cell that it's living in. And as long as the, the cell is in a healthy, calm, peaceful place, 
it's a theme, the virus and the cell remain in an equilibrium balance. Chris, you're talking about in the nucleus. Was where it sets up shop? So, or... so good. Um, for your listening audience, uh, I, I like to describe the size of the virus, if I may. To kind of just, and I know I'm going off the track here a little bit for your question, but if if you, if I am a, a a B lymphocyte sitting here, and I'm holding a basketball or a soccer ball, that would be the relative size of a bacteria. You know, it's going to maybe damage the outside membrane, but it's not going to get inside the cell. Now, if I'm holding a tiny little vitamin D capsule, that would be the relative size of a virus to me, a white blood cell. So it can get anywhere in the cell that it needs to. And of course, it needs to get in the nucleus. Why? It needs to borrow our DNA machinery. Our, our, our chromosomal DNA. So, and this is what's interesting about viruses, Andrew, is that, you know, there's some virologists that don't even list viruses as life forms because they're dependent on us for replication or other mammals or uh, for replication. So yeah, the EBV is living inside the nucleus. So all of this process that I'm describing will take place primarily within the nucleus, right? So in a latency, it sets up a nice quiet little place. Um, would you like me to go on into like what happens with chronic? Yes, please. Okay, so 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 when when the virus is in its latent state, it will, I mentioned it kind of sets up shop. It sets up um, a little factory to keep itself in its latent state. But really what it's doing, it's using nine to 10 genes on a regular basis to regulate the internal of the cells. And this is absolutely mind boggling, fascinating to me, Andrew. Because what the virus does in that process, it turns off something called toll-like receptors. Toll-like receptors are these transmembrane proteins that listen to cell signaling that alert the cell that there's danger, infection, injury. In, right. It, it turns off the alarm system. It turns off the alarm system. Like, oh my God, is that yeah. a good thing? Absolutely, it's a good thing because it allows the cell to immortalize. I mean, it really allows the cell to continue to replicate and, and be in place because the toll-like receptors will create autophagy and, and apoptosis if they're highly triggered. So the virus is in latent state. It's always there kind of working this low grade regulation of cell function it also i'm sorry chris can sorry to interrupt i just want to clarify a point before we yeah. get further into that so if the latent virus or if the virus is turning off in a latent state the toll like receptors and that's immortalizing the cell you're saying that's a good thing for the cell because there's more longevity of the cell or there's also a double-edged sword to that well there's a well. double-edged sword okay to okay. It. okay yeah and the double edge is that um, it allows the virus to remain replicating or in control. Mm -hmm. So the, the way I like to explain this relation, Andrew, is that in a healthy individual or healthy cell, assuming that no one is going to escape the infection of this virus, but in a healthy environment, there's a mutually respectful relation that can be established between the virus and the host. That's what the latency place is. It's good for both of them. It's more self-serving, in my opinion, for the virus than us. But hey, we've grown up over 100 million years with this dude. So it's always <laughs> like not getting rid of it. So we have to accept it. And that's really the theme for me in terms of clinician. We have to find a way to establish that mutual relation and balance within the cell. Now, 
what happens in the lytic phase, and this is what links into chronic active EBV, is if the virus becomes threatened, if it senses danger to its survival, instinctively, it's going to go, I'm out of here. So it will go into replication phase, which is called its lytic phase. So it will go from a regulation of nine genes up to 122 genes. So that's like a 12-fold increase in cellular metabolic activity. And that's where the problems will arise as we get into this discussion. So in the lytic phase, the virus upregulates then starts making all these excessive, well, viral replication proteins for making viral babies so that it's surviving. And then they're they're secreted out of the cell, either through the membrane or lysosomes, not lysosomes, but endoplasmic. And, um, and they keep replicating, then go infect other cells, et cetera, et cetera. I just have one question to, to go back for the acute EBV infection. You mentioned, sure. you know, there's different... Uh, things that that could be you know seen symptom wise like fever or uh, cervical lymphadenopathy, which is sort of a inflammation of of some of the, the lymph nodes in the in the um, the yeah. the front part of the neck. Um, you know, uh, throat issues. You know, may, maybe a sore throat. You know, different things like that. Uh, upper respiratory type symptoms. What if our listeners uh, listeners might be saying, hey, you know, Doctor Bum. Um, I, I, you know, my, my Epstein-Barr antibody tests are positive, but I don't remember having acute mono. Is it possible to have asymptomatic infection of mono? I'm, I'm giving you the softball here, but yeah. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh my God, it's such a perfect question because I have patients in all the time. So, you know, the lead question that I ask clinically is, um, how are you doing with fatigue? How's your energy? And there's usually concomitant association with decreased energy that many patients just assume is their normal, or they're just assuming that they're decreasing in energy because they're aging. Um, brain fog is another associated uh, kind of broader clinical symptom. Skin rashes, some GI distress. Um, basically, Andrew, any sign or symptom that could relate to an increase in oxidative damage on a cellular level can be attributable to this lytic phase because of what happens in the cell. So, so yeah, there's a whole, but getting back to your, uh, your question, individuals very often, patients very often don't remember having infectious mono and but they're usually individuals who are you know either they're young mothers or they're mothers who started with symptoms as young mothers so they may have teenagers now but the, you know things change soon as i was um, a young mother and i just attributed to the stresses of being a mom um young overachievers Absolutely. Young high school kids, adolescents who are, are playing two and three sports, they're, they're straight A's in their studies, and they're always pushing that high level of adrenergic drive. Those individuals, oh, yeah, I remember having a cold or a kind of a fluey thing for a week or two. It knocked me down, but I kept going, those kinds of things. But I was yeah. never diagnosed for mono, right? The other problem with that is the the rapid mono test is so unreliable that even if a child is taken to the pediatrician and they run that rapid test, it's it's not um, efficacious for a good diagnosis. Okay, so everyone, at least ninety five percent or more people, have it. Very, not everyone is symptomatic in an acute phase. And then you mentioned a few things that could mm -hmm. be associated with chronic Epstein-Barr, it sounds like more in the lytic phase, like fatigue, brain fog, gut issues, skin rash. Right. Any other symptoms that would be, you know, something you see clinically in your practice and stuff? Those are the primary. Okay. Um, I, I will see on occasion um, um, arthralgias um, as well, myalgias as well, especially in the upper body. Again, um, associating any any increased oxidative damage 
to the downstream consequences, um, what what that might look like in organs and tissues. So the other part of this, Andrew, is the um, potential for EBV and and their bro- its brothers, um, cytomegalo and her- human herpivirus six, to um, damage or affect other glands and tissues. So, and thyroid is probably the best studied. Multiple sclerosis autoimmunity is another one that's very well studied. But what? So whenever I see anyone, any patient who has signed symptoms of thyroiditis, hypothyroid, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, um, I immediately am thinking, oh, I wonder if there's a viral uh, interplay here as well. Yes, yes, I, I agree. I think, you know, Hashimoto's multiple sclerosis, we know there's a big, there's a big study that came out a couple of years ago. Um, that that there was this association, or I think they even concluded there was a, a p- potential causation with with Epstein Barr being a, a potential root cause for MS. Correct? Absolutely. In fact, I just read in review of our discussion to see if there's any newer literature, and there's absolutely um, a, a a very robust study of looking at. Um, I think it was like 10 million military. Um, recruits over a period of time and a very definitive causative relation between EBV and MS. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and and I, I think this is a $64,000 question, although I may bump it up to 128 with the inflation now. <laughs> the, <laughs> the function of medicine practice, you know, we know we're always evaluating not only one, but multiple root causes of, of things and everything kind of acts, you know, synergistically. Right. How do we know as, as clinicians and, and how do we know as patients, you know, people are listening or anyone that's listening, if if these things like fatigue, brain fog, skin rashes, GI issues are from, you know, gut dysbiosis or if they're from toxins or, you know, versus a chronic infection like Epstein-Barr or, or some other infection. Like how do we, if we get a bunch of lab tests back, if you get a bunch bunch of data back how do we how do we sort out to, to all those different possible threads so it distills down to treating the patient rather than the test right and, exactly and and really it's so so my my clinical approach in working with a very complex individual who has multiple imbalances in multiple systems is to work from the obvious and distill down and and I will say that there are two primary um, therapeutic drives for me in that process. One is to work on the cellular process. And I think we'll want to talk about that in detail. So that's that's a primary. And then second, or it's 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 not that I make a distinction between cellular damage and cellular function and the gastrointestinal tract, but they are a one, one level. And I'm, I, I start more with the detoxification and cellular work than the gut work. Um, for, um, for this reason, it's easier for me to get patients to go through a, a noticeable positive change when I can help them change their lifestyle and have them sense an improvement in their overall energy and sense of vitality. Um, gut rehab takes a while, and it's it's a slow moving process. So I usually okay. do that second. So so that's great. I want to I want to make sure we get to that um, yeah, f- for this session. I think that um, th- thank you thank you so much, Chris. Um, wanted to get uh, for a couple of the the intro uh, kind of um, setup questions a bit in terms of. You know, why do some people, you know, 95% of the population has Epstein-Barr. Um, they may or may not remember acute mono, like we said. Um, how do we, what are some of the underlying factors that contribute to the development and persistence of chronic Epstein-Barr in, in some individuals, whereas other people may be walking around with, you know, amazing energy, they're walking around like Olympians or running and, you know, different things like that. How do we, how do you, how do you kind of, um, kind of parse that out there? So I tease that apart this way, Andrew. I um I think about what are the what are the 
potential antecedents and triggers using functional medicine parlance um, that may lead to imbalances or compromises in an individual. Ultimately, you see, if I if I use the word stress, it does not get it at all because stress um, can come from multifactorial places. So it can be spiritual stress, emotional stress, mental stress. It can be structural stress. It can be environmental stress. It can be intracellular stresses. So, but anything that causes an increased burden on the cellular function is going to potentially cause the virus to feel threatened and so consequently going up into lytic phase it's going to want to jump off the ship essentially oh yeah it's the virus to, it's going to jump out of the ship yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah so yes exactly and so so um so there and so this is where you can tie gastrointestinal disorders like dysbiosis or an inflamed gut or heightened immune response in the gut or increased permeability to an upstream trigger for increased cellular burden from the um, endotoxin buildup of, say, LPS or um, protein fragments or whatever it may be that causes an increase on a cellular reaction. All of these kinds of things will lead to um, the virus being threatened, hence going up into lytic. Sounds like the terrain matters, right? If the terrain is inflamed, then then that's going to cause people to have more likely to have Ep Epstein-Barr that's chronic, uh, an immune system imbalance, et oh, cetera. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and and so I I'm careful about using the the word inflamed or inflammation because it like stress is a it's kind of too broad of a stroke for us to use without defining what we mean by that. Yeah, and 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 so yes, um, to your point, um, Andrew is any we could say it this way, so. So toll-like receptors, one of their jobs is to trigger a whole host of inflammatory cytokines. And so um, tumor necrosis factor will do that. Um, NF-kappa would be anything that triggers these transmembrane signaling molecules that are listening and, and doing a surveillance on our balance will lead to a potential immune and inflammatory response. Yeah. And and that's what, you know, the the variety of triggers is like, oh my God. Um it's it can be huge. Yes. Mm -hmm. And before we get into thank you so much. Before we get into the uh the cellular process that you're talking about, I, I wanted to just touch on how we test for chronic Epstein bar. I know that clinically is really the main thing is, you know, how's the person presenting, treating the person, um, but are there specific tests or markers that are used to identify the presence of Epstein-Barr virus? Yeah, I should probably make a distinction for your audience at this point before I talk about testing. Um, I am not referring or speaking to a very small percentage of individuals with chronic EBV who go and to develop different um, carcinomas and um, it's a good point. Yeah, um, I'm not speaking to that. Um, and though that category um, of patient in the medical arena is considered chronic active EBV that's not what i'm seeing that's not what we're speaking about we're talking about the walking wounded the 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 um the gray areas for individuals that are poorly defined poorly diagnosed that are chronic that can then be associated with this process. That... Kind of like the tip of the iceberg. What what we see in the conventional medicine world is that Epstein-Barr, it may contribute to maybe more extreme imbalances that might lead to the development of 
of cancers is that is that sort of accurate but then there's a bunch of things underneath that water that mm. that it could still affect that maybe is not uh accepted by the conventional medical world Correct. in terms of how yeah. how that would be affected yeah that's well said andrew yeah the the cancers and there's a, a number of different specific cancers that are clearly related to ebv the fraction, the percentage of individuals contracting those. And it's thought in the medical research that there's, you know, everything always gets distilled down to a genetic predisposition. I kind of try to refrain from that thinking because it's too reductionistic. Um, um, I suspect um, that there's, there is a predisposition in certain individuals who are chronically stressed um, who then may lead to, say, a lymphoma, um, as an example. Mm -hmm. But that's yeah. that's not what we're speaking to today. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Really good point. Really good distinction. Okay. Um, so, so, so yeah, testing. Where where are you testing. testing there? So the, the testing is um, <clears throat> it's interesting, Andrew. Um, EBV specifically has some fairly robust and what I think are reliable markers for the clinician to make a pretty good assessment of where this virus is. Now, just as a little tangential side, cytomegalovirus and human herpivirus 6, which are the Epstein-Barr virus's brothers, they do not have the type of testing that I'm going to speak to. They only show... IgA, I mean, IgG or IgM related immune response. Okay. With that said, so, so what I find the most reliable, useful um, testing are the traditional sero um, immunoglobulin testings that reflect immune reactivity to three different proteins in the virus. Those three proteins are first viral capsid antigen, the second is nuclear antigen, and the third is early antigen. The viral capsid antigen will show a positive IgM for acute in the first two weeks. Post-acute infection, the IgM diminishes and the immune, the B cells produce IgG mediated um, so that within two to four weeks after initial infection, the, the patient will show an, an increase in VCA IgG. That simply, in my explanation, Andrew, just tells you as the clinician that the patient has been exposed to the virus. It doesn't give an idea of its action or activity, just how much. But there's an interesting correlate that I can make for you, and that is this. The higher the VCA IgG tends to indicate how robust that virus may have been in the initial infection, or it's certainly a measurement of how robust the lymphocytes have gone to respond to it. So, so there isn't any research that connects that. That's clinical experience and insight. So when I look at someone who comes in with a greater than 600 VCA IgG, I know that they've been slammed with the virus. Okay, but that's not as all lost there. So the other two markers, nuclear antigen, again, I'm mostly interested in IgG because it's going to give me an idea of chronic surveillance, immune surveillance, if you will. The nuclear antigen relates to the latent phase. So that's a marker that's going to tell the clinician that the virus is in this kind of equilibrium status. But again, the level of that nuclear antigen will kind of give you a sense of how robust 
the infection is. So even though a virus may be in latent stage, remember I said that it's still activating nine different genes to keep that cell regulated, the more, the more, more robust. So, so, so if a, if a clinician sees the nuclear antigen elevated IgG, it's going to indicate latent phase. However, if the third protein, early antigen, shows an elevation, and I don't, in this one, I don't, to me, it doesn't matter if the E, Early antigen is just a little bit elevated or severely elevated. It tells me that the virus is up in its lytic phase. I was going to ask you about that, the amplitude of that. It sounds like yeah. it varies for different people, but yeah. It does vary, Andrew. And But with the early antigen, um, I don't make a distinction so much with that, though I can. But see, because I've done this for so long, I've I, I've been I, I started looking at Epstein Barr virus in chronic fatigue back in the early '80s. So you know we're talking forty years of watching this virus, and so clinically, well, yeah, I can make a a, a clinical association easily that the increased numbers of those EA of the early antigen do correlate with signs and symptoms. Do, do, do you see, um, Dr. Bump, do you see the early antigen IgG, which is indicating, like you said, the lytic phase, or, or the um, or the nuclear antigen, which has um, antibody, which is indicating latent phase, do you see those fluctuate and respond to, to yeah. treatments like up and down, or is it not predictable there? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Very rarely will I see the viral capsid antigen come down. But I will often see the nuclear antigen come down or go up, depending. So yes, and certainly the early antigen does the same. It can come up and down. So I will see fluctuations in immune, uh, immune response to those. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, great, great. I think we we'll want to get into the uh, your process there about you know how you use the process of detoxification and, and cellular health. Um, maybe sure. we can get into that and we can kind of integrate some of the things that that you would, how you would, how you would, uh, you know, I guess, address or treat this. Sure, I would like to do it. Before I do that, Andrew, I think it's, it's worth hearing this. Um, since COVID, I have seen a very unique shift in Epstein-Barr virus presentations. And not only am I seeing an increase in reactivations in the early antigens, that's like, I mean, it's like, oh my gosh, what's it? Um, but also I have seen in a handful of patients, which is bizarre, new infections, actual IgM um, elevations indicating acute new infections. And, and I, uh, I haven't been able to find anything that correlates or explains that process so much, um, or if it's a false reading because of the COVID, but it's just something that I- Thank you for bringing that up. And, and I think uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts actually, since we're on top of COVID about how, is there an association that you've seen uh, in your practice or, or research at all? in terms of a uh, long COVID or kind of post viral inflammation and then, and then, you know, reactivating Epstein-Barr as well. Absolutely. There's a, there's a very strong correlation. In fact, um, in the IFM at the Institute for Functional Medicine, they have a long COVID protocol and they've done some research in looking at this correlation and have seen a very definitive correlate with an increase in activation of EBV. You, you almost have to wonder if some of the long COVID symptoms are, are not only from the persistence of the virus or immune system activation, but also the reemergence of Epstein-Barr. Yeah, good point. A good point. And when we talk about the um, therapies or my approach to interventions, it'll make sense. And so again, as I said, we're not treating the bug. We're not treating yeah. the virus as much as the human. That's um, a huge point because the bug's going to be in the system no matter what. 
Exactly. I think that's a really key point for Epstein Barr for Lyme disease. Often, unless you get it right away, I think yeah. a lot of times these persistent viruses or stealth infections that act like viruses, yeah. like because Lyme is a bacteria, but it it kind of acts like a virus too. Sure, mycoplasma, and mycoplasma, and then the cousins, like you said, are brothers, brothers or sisters. I don't know. Are they brothers or sisters? Uh, well, <laughs> yeah, really, because they're beta viruses, so they have a little bit of a difference to them. Okay, okay, yeah. okay. But so, you know, yeah, I think um, something that I'd like to share with you that um, it, it's kind of a more of a clinical observation for me because I've I've been. Um, so interested in these viruses over a long period of time, there is definitely an increase in, in over the past 20 some odd years in the elevations of these viruses that I see in patients. And, and I can't help, and of course, I haven't seen any studies that verify this, I'm just making a clinical association towards stress response. And yeah. what has happened in our culture, the Western cultures, um, I don't see much Asian population, but um, but in the Western culture, there's just been such an extraordinary amount of stress since 2001 in, in the patient's reactivity to life, from news to environment to so much uh, politics economic. and then and then the emfs right the electromagnetic fields and yeah sort of the yeah. oxidative stress from the environment yes and so so i think that we could draw a pretty clear line um of increase associated as stress increases the the activity maybe we shouldn't watch the news as much then I don't know if that's oh my gosh Andrew I so strongly <laughs> advocate I I actually um I don't mandate it but I recommend all patients to stop turn the television off just no news in any form digital yeah. detox yeah well it it is and I I asked the question um when you're when you're engaged with a screen and you're listening to or watching how do you feel from that? Do you feel positive and, and engaged and charged in a, in a life-giving, loving way? Or you feel fear and angry? And, and if it's negative, tell them, why would you do that? You know, it's like, why would you subject yourself to that? It's a good so, point. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Great advice. Mm, so, so you want to hear about the cellular stuff and what I think goes Yeah, on. I think that sounds great. So, so what I, I, I will say about Epstein-Barr, Andrew, really applies in my clinical experience across the board that anything that increases cellular reactivity will affect its function. So, so if, um, well, so without going into too much nuance and details here, when I described the virus going up into its lytic phase, it's in this nice, quiet, mutual nine gene kind of mutual relation to 122 genes. Well, that would be like this. That would be like you're working in an office building with 100 people, and the office building is set up perfectly for all of you in your business all your supplies are needed all your exits are needed all your communication is nicely met and then one day you come in and you say management up above says we have to share a space with a thousand people like oh my god it would create such a burden such a mess so that's that's kind of like a pictorial i like to use of what happens on a cellular level when the virus goes up into its lytic phase, you're getting a 12-fold increase in metabolic activity. So what does that look like? A 12-fold increase in reactive species, whether they're oxygen or nitrogen or sulfur. So those reactive species then have to be neutralized or they have to be dealt with with our own natural antioxidation process associated with that because of the oxidative 
potential damage from all of these reactive species, you will, the patient or the cell suffers in two primary ways. One is a loss of energy because of electron stealing, I guess you would call it swiping or borrowing. So these free radicals can easily be neutralized or stabilized is a better word with the electrons from the um, ATP, I mean, uh, from mitochondrial respiratory chain. So that's one source. So that's where energy comes into play. The other has to do with signaling proteins in the and the actual cell membrane itself. So that, again, the cell membrane, the phospholipid membrane, and the transmembranes signaling proteins, whether they're through the, the, um, the, the cell membrane itself or the organelle membranes, they're, they're offering free lunch for better stability to these. So they're offering electrons to stabilize. Consequently, then, the downstream of that is loss of function. So then our cell membranes and our organelles can't communicate with each other and the outer environment so well. I'm being clear. Yeah, okay. yeah that makes sense. <clears throat> so if you ramp that up 12 fold, it puts an incredible burden on our antioxidant systems and eventually our detoxification enzymes. And, and this is one of the areas for me that gets overlooked in the functional medicine community, though we speak about detoxification and biotransformation we don't often enough relate it right down into the cellular process because we're always thinking about these exogenous insults like heavy metals and environmental pollutants etc but we forget that cellular components and endogenously produced waste like from viruses also need to be detoxified. In fact, humans inherently evolved these cytochrome P450 enzymes in response primarily to microbes and plant phenols, you know, that were toxic to bugs and, and potentially toxic to us. So our isoenzymes, the P450s, kind of developed out of that. So but in this picture I'm trying to create for you, Andrew, so if there's this excess of burden, then there's going to be also increased autophagy, um, apoptosis. But it's more that I believe the autophagy and the viral breakdown and the cellular waste that needs to be detoxified. For, and, for the audience, I'm sorry, can you... Can you just kind of describe what autophagy is? Just to oh understand? yeah, so so autophagy is the breakdown and clearing out of used cellular parts. That's how I like to describe it. So when parts of the cell need replacing and repair, we have this kind of auto destruct. So they kind of dissolve, and and the membranes and the internal proteins of these. Um, organelles need to be cleaned up and neutralized. And remember that that the cell, see, the, the, the detoxification enzymes, and the reason I, I, I harp on this a little bit, Andrew, is that they are phospholipids, right? So, so if you have a, a membrane from a virus or bacteria or your own inherent endogenously produced, um, they need to be broken down and cleaned out. They need to be um, hydrolyzed by the cytochrome P450 enzymes. That's really how we evolved them. So for me, therapeutically, <laughs> I know I'm rambling and going on here. No, that's great. That's great. Um, it's, it's so important for me to support the detoxification pathways um, and antioxidation pathways. They're really one in the same in, in a in a huge what way. about uh, cell or mitochondrial membrane support? Are you thinking also things like giving someone phosphatidylcholine and other, yeah, other I, fatty acids and things? Yeah, my favorite is actually the CDP uh, citicholine. It's a precursor for the phospholipids. 
Yeah. Okay. So I'm um, interesting little sidebar. I had patients on city choline prior to um because i've used it for years to support cellular membrane structure um and 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 it was uncanny they just did not contract the covid virus mm, okay. um it's like eventually there's some of the mutations yes but yeah i love the city choline for you but to answer your question yes the phosphatidylcholines are so critically important um, for uh, regeneration of the phospholipid membranes, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So, what what other things are you thinking in terms of how to support the cellular process? You mentioned uh, things like antioxidants. Talk yeah. about phospholipids. Any other any other thoughts? Especially, I think I think we should also touch on ideally the role of nutrition and and lifestyle yeah. there other yeah. things like that that would affect um, maybe other nutraceuticals or herbs that would affect the the cellular sure. membrane health yeah um perfect lead in so so if, if you if we consider the whole human the whole patient and 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 not get you know reduced down to the specific imbalances we go well, what dietarily, what is the thing that you want to orient towards? Well, you want to orient towards any dietary change that reduces immunological burden um, or cellular metabolic burden. So what's that look like? Clean, organic, non-chemicalized, non-processed foods and an elimination of the most renowned antigens. So the most renowned, as you know, are the, the, the glutens and gliadins and the caseins and corn soy and we can eat peanuts and we can go right down the list. So I will always put patients on a strict elimination diet as I have, have them jump into um, a therapeutic protocol, increasing, um, increasing their clean protein sources and organic vegetables when possible. And if they can tolerate fruits, some, especially the high um, uh, high nutrient valued fruits. And it sounds like no alcohol either. Alcohol would be part of the elimination diet. I know a lot of people are oh. on this elimination diet and they're like, but I have two drinks at night. Oh my God. So so I'm currently doing research and hope to um, present and write a book about a functional medicine approach to alcohol. Oh, nice. That is well needed. I, I, I'm oh, my God. So and, excited about that. Uh, so alcohol, Andrew, actually dissolves the phospholipid membranes. It is so friggin' destructive. But, you know, and here's the, the caveat in this. Yeah, alcohol is, I can almost say that there's no positive thing about alcohol except this. It is one of the few drugs, chemicals, that humans have access to that literally quiets and calms their cells, which when you consider the pain and suffering of the human journey, it's okay to take a break. It's okay to disconnect. Alcohol is absolutely wonderful for that, as is marijuana, those two in particular. Um, the other hallucinogens and other that's a whole different discussion um from a psycho spiritual perspective but when i'm thinking okay so it's it's relaxing it's wonderful but the question is what are the damages and what is your tolerance and um how free you know so there's this risk reward like yeah yeah what's what's kind of going on there yeah absolutely that, that is, so yeah yeah, as you can see, we could go down many. Times. That's a whole nother. Yeah, that's another <laughs> rabbit hole, right? Yeah, yeah, it's hard. It's hard to argue against uh, the social benefits and the the relaxation benefits, like you said. I think maybe for someone with chronic Epstein Barr or, or oxidative stress, you know, it's so no. clearly alcohol is not doing them any favors no. from a Absolutely. cellular membrane perspective. If you're if it's dissolving the the right. phospholipids, that's yeah, that's it's not it's, good. A, it's a definite no. A, an absolute okay. definite no yeah so but c getting back to to like the dietary nutritional thing so so in a in a nutshell really what we want to do is help the patient reduce their stress burdens and that can be metabolic stress burdens so someone who is um insulin resistant and uh, 
uh, or trending towards would do really well with intermittent fasting. Um, the um, uh, stress management from uh, emotional and mental, uh, something that I didn't say um, that I think is relevant here, Andrew, is that, so I'm speaking about how, how, how the virus will upregulate to 120 genes if it's threatened. Well, when when we are in a stress response, when we are in that sympathoadrenal reactivity, that fight or flight, our sympathetic nervous system's upticking, our adrenaline's upticking, our, uh, our what happens on a cellular level there is we're also increasing metabolic rate. So, so in stress response, some researchers say it will increase metabolic activity a hundredfold, but most can concur that it's at least a tenfold increase. So, so, so you can have this double whammy of, of viral upregulation, stress upregulating. And so, yeah, so anything we do to help quiet and calm the patient's metabolic burden. I, I think I remember you saying, Chris, that it might have been one of the conferences that uh, chronic stress or, or acute stress or, or chronic, you know, unmitigated stress, especially, will will activate the lytic phase of the virus, like kind yeah. of like more replication. Is that is that Absolutely. accurate? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So so what I when I was speaking a little earlier about the toll-like receptors, um, what I should have made a distinction about is that there's uh, there's there's transmembrane toll-like receptors on the outside of the cell, and then there's in endogenous or intracellular toll-like receptors. The EBV in its in its latent phase turns off the internal ones. Okay, so the the intracellular toll-like receptor. There's two of them, five and nine, I believe. But the the transmembrane ones, the outer ones, do not get turned off. Okay, and that's so important. They, so yeah, so that's where the triggers of stress come because that's what what uh, toll-like receptors are doing. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Stress will trigger the transmembrane or the intracellular or both for the transmembrane. The transmembrane, what's a different mechanism than? Uh, yeah, it's the first stage in yeah. alerting the cell. Now yeah. the internal ones, what I've established is the internal ones are turned off and yeah. that's what allows the cells to immortalize. Yeah. Uh, but the external, the transmembrane one, that uh, that's uh, will still respond to a stress response. And th that indeed is what will trigger the virus up into its lytic phase. Now, now in terms of, uh, and I, I know this is a little getting into the science of this, but I just want to ask you if, if the cells are immortalized because the intracellular T TLR toll-like receptors are turned off, d does that mean these cells will eventually become cancerous or do they just eventually die because of other, you know, oxidative stress, et cetera? So we'd like to think that they go through apoptosis eventually because yeah. of long-term overuse rather okay. than developing into cancer yeah. it's a really good question i don't have a really clear answer for that and it may be one of the triggers for the development for say um a lymphoma uh, yeah over got it yeah. okay so 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 having having something where where you know intermittent fasting may may promote or you know apoptosis in that cleanup of the junkyard so it doesn't keep yes. on getting immortalized you know we don't want immortalized junkyard essentially Correct. which is what happens with with cancer okay thank you that, that's very helpful um any i know a lot of people are trying different things like um uh loracidin or you know just to name a couple of things olive leaf extract i mean what, what are your thoughts on nutraceuticals vitamins so good. things like good. that um uh, there's two that are really well studied that reduce they 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 dampen down the lytic phase okay so that's real valuable the one that has the most robust study is um artemisinin or okay or good old-fashioned mugwort yeah um so artemisinin it's um the the biosynthetic of that is called artisanate 
Um, that's a step removed, but the Artemis in it is amazing. It's powerful too. So that's number one. Um, number two is berberine. And berberine, like curcumin, it, it, it's kind of like one of these fundamental broad spectrum beneficial herbs that touches everything. But it has a significant body of literature showing it too being able to dampen the lytic phase. Didn't know that one. That's good. That's good. And, and then and especially because you can use it for metabolic syndrome also. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, anti inflammatory and and interesting, there's studies that show that it has a um associated um a synergistic benefit with curcumin as an anti-cancer therapy. Nice. Well. Yes. Yeah, Thank, you. Thank you for mentioning that. Yeah. Um, and then, so we talked about detox and a, a lot of things here, but I, I love, I love how it's, it's all about really uh, treating the terrain, you know, more than the bug. I mean, there's certain specific things. Um, I, I guess I just want to about vitamin D, you know, vitamin D is all we always know is that's got a lot of press recently with COVID. Um, what is the role of, of say, you know, vitamin, vitamin D, maybe serum levels, if that's, if that's a thing with Epstein bar, or, you know, where do people, where should people mm. kind of keep the vitamin Ds? So, so I don't have a real good answer about vitamin D. I check it. I put patients on it, but I'm, I'm not, clearly um versed in saying there's a direct correlation um what i can say that i do is um i test both the calcitriol or the 125 dihydroxy vitamin d and the 25 hydroxy the difference being that the 25 hydroxy is more of a reservoir form and the 125 is a more active form so i'd like to look at that ratio um, I like to see the active form up in the 50, 60 range. Um, and what's interesting, I c you can see with vitamin D, as long as that active form, the 125 dihydroxy is up in that 60 range, even though the 25 di, 25 hydroxy might be, say, in the 30 range, and somebody's more inclined to supplement for that, it tells you that they're using it well and converting it well. And that for me is, is the important punch. That's a there. really, that's a really good point. Mm -hmm. um, any, any thoughts about the GI tract on uh, you, you mentioned that that's, that's a whole nother deep dive there really. But, but, uh, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> so how I interpret the GI tract, especially with patients who are chronically um, compromised with uh, this syndrome, if we want to call it a syndrome, chronic Epstein-Barr virus. Um, inevitably, I don't think that I've ever not seen some type of gastrointestinal distress. Um, and that can be as simple as indigestion and low hydrochloric acid to full-blown dysbiosis, leaky gut, and lipopolysaccharide increases. Um, so there's a whole gamut um, because of the influence of the gastrointestinal tract on every single system of the body. It has to be considered for me as part of a therapeutic drive. Um, now, how I go about doing that might different. I, I do some specialized testing. Um, but sometimes history alone and clinical signs and symptoms are plenty adequate um, to to help derive. Um, Thank you. I just had a chicken or egg question on that. So can Epstein-Barr cause leaky gut and, and intestinal permeability and cause GI issues or more the GI issues are then kind of leading it from a, lit a latent to a lytic phase on the EBD? Oh, that's a loaded one. Um, I believe it can go both ways. Um, there is interesting that you asked that question andrew because there's a recently over the past year two there's an increase investigation and interest in the gi effects of ebv especially around poorly defined irritable bowel um uh, yeah uh, colitis um, any chronic inflamed irritation may have an etiology associated with ebv okay yeah. 
Thank you. And then one more vitamin question I have, because, um, you know, we use a lot of zinc and ascorbic acid as, as possible. I just wanted to ask you about zinc. And also there was a study that you, you know about from the Riordan Clinic. Um, Dr. Mikarova did a study in 2014 on intravenous ascorbic acid or intravenous vitamin C. And it did show a reduction, I believe, in, in uh, I think a 40% reduction in, in some of the Epstein-Barr antibodies with like say 10 treatments or so of, of IVC. What are your thoughts on, on zinc and then and the vitamin C? So uh, I'll answer the vitamin C because the study was using IV vitamin C and yes, it's absolutely, but it was one study in, in a group of patients. I'd like to see more of that, right. but you know, when, when we think about glutathione and vitamin C and some of these kind of ubiquitous antioxidants that are, um, it makes perfect sense, um, to work to increase them however we do it whether we use a liposomal glutathione um or an oral vitamin c um loading it loading vitamin c to tolerance it, it makes perfect sense for cellular support um and i haven't seen any follow-ups on that particular study that you're citing but it's it's certainly hopeful yeah the and then, one. and then, sorry to before the zinc. I, this is kind of a evolving to a super advanced episode now, but <laughs> just had a question because um we we were chatting with a an expert on oxalates recently, and and basically this idea that ascorbic acid can can lead to more oxalate production, which could be inflammatory in and of itself. So, any any thoughts about sort of oxalates does that have any role in in any of this with ebv and uh, so so oxalates are tricky for me because whenever i see increases in oxalates say in an organic acid test i'm i'm thinking more yeast more uh, more than anything so i'm thinking dysbiosis especially with um candida or saccharomyces okay. driving that process okay. Um, so that's where my head goes clinically, okay. rather than getting real myopic into, oh my God, now we have to remove all oxalates from the diet, which becomes really challenging. That's tough. That's tough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. So, so then zinc, um, do you, do you use zinc in your practice at all for? So zinc is one EBV? of the fundamentals. Yeah. But, um, we can make an assumption that most people are, are, are going to be deficient in zinc its efficacy in so the zinc for me has two primary functions protein synthesis and immunological differentiation so it's really important in both of those and so both of those roles are implicated in this whole burden of oxidative damage and cellular function right so so yeah yes to zinc all the time absolutely um but here's the problem or the challenge that we need to look at we have to look at it in relation to copper and even iron because the metalloproteins that regulate those are doing this triad dance. And so, so you can potentially put someone on zinc and have them bind it because their uh, copper might be out of balance to the zinc. So, so, and that would look like possibly let's see how would that work i'd have to think that out andrew but but i will always look at the relation between the copper and zinc in particular same yeah yeah that that makes sense um well i i wanted to thank you so much dr bump for coming on today we have a couple of closing questions this is really fascinating and i think we took a, a deep dive down a couple of rabbit holes today so thank you thank you oh, for my that pleasure. I'd love to ask you, Chris, what is one thing you wish everyone knew about treating chronic Epstein-Barr Epstein virus? The one thing that I would suggest, based on what you're hearing in our conversation, Andrew, is to learn to love the virus, learn to accept it, learn to be at peace with the virus. And the okay. only way we can do that is to nurture and love ourselves mm. and to be at peace with ourselves. Yeah. Inherently, what I'm saying in that is that we have to reduce our stress burdens. Okay. That's Every a really great time. advice. So right. that's by far the most important to me. Making yeah. peace with the bugs, making peace with ourselves, 
Yep, absolutely. It's very similar. They, they, they intertwine. It's they intertwine, uh, right. Cool. Uh, yes. um, and then part of a mission at Capital Integrative Health here is making integrative health care more accessible, focusing on the small steps we can do to improve our health. So, Chris, we'd love to hear from you. This is a very fun <laughs> question, usually. Just a, one personal thing under $20 that you feel has transformed your own health. So I love this question, Andrew. So for your listening audience, they need to know that you sent that to me so I could think about it. And I did. And I had so much fun with that question. And I went through all kinds of different gyrations. And mind you, I'm 70 years of age. And so my health journey in terms of not only as a physician, but personally goes back almost 55 years. And I'll tell you, the, there are two single things that were easily, well, the book I would recommend is easily under $20. But the process that I went through, I uh, the, so I will say it this way. There was a book that changed my relation to health, and it was a biography of Edgar Cayce. Um, Edgar Cayce was a was also known as the sleeping prophet. He's very much akin to how Abraham works through Esther Hicks. He, um, he, in a sense, channeled this voice that gave answers to individuals who were unwell. And all of his answers were based on, and he called it the Ischaic records, or it was beyond him. But they were all remedies that were natural non-pharmaceutical, non-surgical. And when I read There is a River, there's two biographies that I like from about. It changed my life. It actually is what caused me to explore what I'm doing now. It set up that model for me. So because it opened up this window of awareness for me. So that was number one. Number two was Casey recommended an apple diet, a three to five day apple diet. And it was the very first thing I did. I was probably 17 or 18 years of age um, and took myself through this five day apple diet. That And that was, I mean, it probably cost me $10 to do back in 1977 uh, or five or whenever it was but it was certainly well under 20 bucks and it was life-changing for me because of this reason in choosing not to eat food and only orient towards apple it it caused me to be very mindful and thoughtful about my relation with food and my relation with myself and it it so it it, it became more of a spiritual exercise for me rather than just mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so and i i wouldn't necessarily recommend most individuals to do an apple diet at this point in time but it sets kind of like the the, the foundation yeah that's so interesting i've, I've uh, read about an apple diet with some other different books and you know it has structured water in it and different things but it really sounds like a spiritual journey too like you said it's it's yeah. like it's either fasting or some something where it's a mono diet where you're just yeah. really focusing inward which is really yeah. amazing yeah you know andrew i didn't get to talk to you much about and i'll say this because it ties into what i just said about the apple diet i took that concept and um, and applied it to the detoxification program I take patients through currently. So I take patients through a 28-day detoxification using a medicinal food powder that supports these pathways. But in, in the middle of that program, I take them through five days of just drinking this medicinal food shake for the same reasons. It's, yeah. it's that valuable. Yeah. It's that type of, you know, similar to the apple diet where they're kind of going through... I, I think I have I have definitely noticed that too when I go through like a a TLC detox or you know something like that it it starts yeah. to get really deep into the into not just the body but the the mind emotions and spirit totally. for sure Completely. yes thank you for sharing that um and and Dr Bump um thank you so much for coming on today and My this pleasure. has been a really great conversation yeah. um 
I, I love the, uh, by the way, I love your screen. I'm not sure if the screensaver, or it's like a, a, a Jackson Pollock thing behind you. I'm not oh, sure what that is. <laughs> so I'll tell you about that. That That's a, I did that painting. Okay. I'm okay. sitting here in COVID going, wow, those books <laughs> are so boring. That, yeah. that pictures, and I said, I got to do something to spice this up. So I, I, I did that. Beautiful, beautiful. Th thank you. Well, Dr. Bone, we just want to ask you, um, Chris, how listeners uh, can learn more about you and work with you if, if they want to kind of go sure. to your clinic or different things. Sure. So so I have a website at drbump.com. That's easy. Um, and that's probably the easiest way for anyone to get in touch with me, but I'm not adverse to sharing my email. And that's drcjbump, Dr. C J Bump at gmail okay easy enough yeah thank, thank you, you so it, much it was really your pleasure thank you so much for joining us today for this episode of the capital integrative health podcast a quick reminder that the information we share in this podcast is meant for educational and informational purposes only it's not a substitute for professional medical advice diagnosis or treatment we highly recommend that you speak to a qualified healthcare provider before making any medical or healthcare decisions if you enjoyed this episode, please take a few moments to subscribe and leave us a review. Your reviews help us reach more people and continue to offer innovative insights and information to better optimize your health and wellness.